Greetings fellow men, Servus Männer, it's Red Pill Germany again and today I want to talk about the physics of socio-economic systems. I wanted to introduce that to the MGTOW community and to the Red Pill Manosphere for a long time already. Because what is really the most exciting for me about MGTOW and Red Pill philosophy is the thirst for knowledge and the quest for understanding human beings, their interaction and their decision making and so on and so forth. So in my old department, uh, when I was still a physicist at the university, whenever we went to the DPG Spring Meeting, that is the annual meeting of the German Society of Physicists, um, there was always a section called the physics of socio-economic systems and we were doing old school physics. We were doing physics with molecules, atoms, lasers, semiconductors and all that stuff which is really good for making money now but of course we were all interested in how you can simulate decision making and peace and war and economics and all that stuff based on statistical physics models. So we always snuck out of our atoms and molecules, lasers and semiconductor sessions and we listened to the uh, physicists uh, telling us about the physics of socio-economic systems which is basically statistical physics applied to the field of sociology. So first of all statistical physics is the physics of uh, many interacting particles basically and it has become incredibly useful in describing gases for example or electrons in a solid so whenever systems become really complex so that you cannot really do measurements and calculate the trajectory of one or just a few particles, you have to um, go back to statistical methods and look at the ensemble rather than the individual parts. You then describe systems in terms of temperature, density and pressure. Here you can see, for example, the velocity distribution in nitrogen gas at different temperatures. So this is not a bell curve, but it is a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution function. It's one of the most um, important, or it's among the most important um, distribution functions in physics. So it plots the probability or the amount of um, molecules in a certain velocity interval. So what statistical physics is also obsessed with, for example, is um, phases and phase transitions. You all know phase transitions. For example, if ice melts, you have a phase transition from solid to liquid phase transition. And um, then when you map out and understand the entire face map in pressure, density and temperature, you can make these uh, three-dimensional phase diagrams or span a certain phase space, but mostly we plot projections of that in two dimensions. And then we can see stuff like triple points or critical points. This is really important in statistical physics. And you can also see that in human phenomena. But today I mainly want to talk about the Easing model and the Voda model that came out of it for sociology then. So the Easing model is a simplified Heisenberg model for interacting magnets. So first think of spins or inherent magnetic momenta like um, compass needles on a two-dimensional array. Now these compass needles feel the uh, magnetic field in their environment but they also have a magnetic field. So when you uh, distribute them or organize them in this two-dimensional array they will self-organize and they will also feel external magnetic fields and the interaction uh, energy can be written down like this. Now that might look really complicated if you're not a scientist, but um, the most important thing here are these little s vectors. And um, they are basically spins and the operator j determines how these little magnetic moments interact, how they will organize. Now a simplified model of this Heisenberg model is the easing model, where you only look at the um, spin component in one direction, in the z direction for example. And then this uh, magnetic needle can only point up or down. It cannot point in any, any other directions. So now you uh, can look for example at two different compass needles and as you all know a magnetic north pole wants to uh, be near to a magnetic south pole and it wants to be as far as possible away from another magnetic north pole. 
so when you look at these two pairs of compass needles uh, next to each other, it is clear to see that the energy, the potential energy in the system where they are parallel is much higher. So S1 times S2 is plus 1 than in the case when they are anti-parallel, because this is how the system quote-unquote wants to be. Anti-parallel, so the energy would be negative one here, a negative contribution or a relatively lower energy. And now if you um, consider after this rule the entire chessboard and you run this on a computer where every uh, pixel on this chessboard, every square on this chessboard is one of those com compass needles which can only have two values. Yeah? plus one or minus one, pointing up or down, and you color code that, and then you randomly pick a square, and then you compute the average magnetic field at that site with the Maxwell-Boltzmann term, you get the probability for that spin to flip, and this you do millions of times, and in this way you calculate the evolution for the entire um, spin lattice for this entire 2D array of little magnetic compass needles. And, and this looks like this now. So here you can see um, the uh, chessboard or the spin lattice is initialized randomly with a 50 50 um, distribution of up and down pointing uh, spin needles. And now you can see that interesting patterns form. You get this lava lamp kind of uh, structures forming. So if you increase the temperature in this system you would get more noise, more randomness, more random spin flips. But if the colder it is, the more order forms and you have these large features that coalesce. Now this is all strictly physics. This is an easing model, it is well understood, it is absolutely physics. But now these crazy social physicists came along and they borrowed that method and the Monte Carlo simulation or the Metropolis algorithm that is used to propagate um, this uh, spin lattice here and they tried to model human behavior with that. And it is called the Voda model. So now think of um, this chessboard as a number of people. Every square on the chessboard is a person and the people can have opinions now. Let's consider for example that a person can only have two opinions in a certain question like voting Democrat or Republican. So let's think now that um, red would for example be Democrat and black would be Republican here. Um, and then people on the chessboard can alter their opinions for example. And there are different rules, different evolution rules now of how they can change their opinion. One would, for example, be you pick a person and that person has four direct neighbors, right? There is one person above, one below, one to the left, one to the right. So that person whose turn it is, he chooses randomly one of his four next neighbors and adopts that guy's opinion. Now that looks something like this. You see that there is complete chaos and the opinions are basically um, floating all over the place. There are no stable formations really. No matter how long you propagate that model, it is complete chaos. And in this model, for example, if people really adopted opinions randomly, there would never be a steady state, you know. That would mean that certain states in the US, for example, would flip all the time between Democrat and Republican, which is not what we really see. So um, this is apparently not how people change their opinion. Now let's change this rule. Let's pick a person and then he would count all the opinions of his four next neighbors and then just adopt the majority position. So if three of his four neighbors vote Republican, he would say, okay, I vote Republican too. Now let's look how this looks like. And now you can see, depending on how um, the board starts and depending on sheer luck actually, on coincidence, you either get um, the um, case where one side completely wins, like here, you see that in the end the whole board is black, so they all vote Republican in the end. Um, but here, in the second example, and I didn't change any of the parameters, I just tried long enough, 
you get this steady state uh, stalemate position between two different camps and doesn't that look like many countries yeah like Tory and Labour Christian Democrats versus Social Democrats or Republicans versus Democrats and so on and so on right so this looks uh, really like something that could describe reality even though it's a very trivial very basic model with not a lot of ingredients just some computing power and some update algorithm for these um, spaces here on the chessboard. Now in a more refined voter model people have actually modeled the United States of America's uh, voting behavior over the last 30 years and you can really describe the voting behavior of the American population with a voter model. I uh, linked to that in the description below and here you can see the evolution over time actually. That is quite interesting already, isn't it? So I think this is pretty impressive already, but um, the physics of socio-economic systems actually explains much more from not only voting, but also traffic flow, uh, human movement, um, economics, the stock market, but also racial segregation. And I want to talk more about this in the future and um, I hope you get some useful ideas and inspiration out of that and um, increase your knowledge as men. So to all of you who are not already asleep or clicked away that uh, video that has nothing to do with uh, monkeys, rape, immigrants or hunter-gatherer society, um, I will read the following introduction to a wonderful review paper by Philip Ball. There is nothing new in the idea that human society can be analyzed using the tools and methods of physics. This belief, however alarming it might seem to some contemporary social scientists and others, lies at the core of most liberal political theories for the past four centuries. The remarkable thing about the plethora of scientific publications today that seek to understand social phenomena using mathematical models of interacting particles is not the boldness of this vision, but the fact that its connection to the past has been largely forgotten. In the 17th century, the theological basis for systems of governance and social order was undermined by the emergence, one might say re-emergence, it was not unfamiliar in ancient Greece, of the concept of natural law, which held that human society could be understood and directed according to reason and logic. Everywhere, says historian George Sabine, the system of natural law was believed to offer the valid scientific line of approach to social disciplines and the scientific guide to social practice. But was natural law really related to physics or was it just the belief that God had made the universe an orderly place? The English philosopher Thomas Hobbes in his treatise Deceive expressed no doubt that the working of society were every bit as mechanical as the workings of clockwork. For as in a watch or some such engine, the matter, figure and motion of the wheels cannot be well known, except it be taken in sunder and viewed in parts, so as to make a more curious search into the rights of states and duties of subjects. It is necessary they be so considered as if they were dissolved, that is, that we rightly understand what the quality of human nature is, in what matter it is, in what not fit to make up a civil government. In other words, to understand society, you need to break it down into its component parts, understand their individual function, and then see how they interact with one another to generate the whole. This was the procedure recommended to natural philosophers by René Descartes in his Discourse on Method as a means of studying nature. Both Hobbes and Descartes were inspired by Galileo. Hobbes, who visited the famous Italian scientist in Florence in 1636, was convinced that Galilean physics established the fundamental rules of governing the behavior of the particles of society, human beings. Hobbes's analytic approach to political science was supplemented 
by the insistence of his friend and protege, William Petty, a founding member of the Royal Society, that social systems be studied empirically by quantifying social numbers, such as populations, budgets, trade figures, and so forth. Petty's approach evolved to the discipline of social statistics, from which much of the modern understanding of statistics as a branch of mathematics emerged. Scientists such as Laplace, Poisson, Maxwell and Boltzmann, and as well as moral philosophers like Immanuel Kant, Auguste Comte, John Stuart Mill and Karl Marx were influenced by the enthusiasm for a statistical perspective on social science. In the light of all this, it is perhaps remarkable that it took modern statistical physics so long to begin finding applications in social science. There are many possible reasons for that delay. One is perhaps that recent social science has tended to adopt the psychological approach to understand human behavior, focusing on the ways in which individuals understand and respond to their social environment. Another is no doubt the perception that social science is a soft science and therefore unsuited to and maybe undeserving of the rigor of the methods common to a hard science like physics. Today, physicists are coming to acknowledge the truth of Herbert Simmons' claim that the social and economic sciences are in fact the hardest sciences in the sense of being the most difficult and complex which rules that can change over time, often in an adaptive manner. The current interest from within the physical sciences in so-called complex systems has also both engendered some confidence in extending their techniques to social systems and stimulated an appreciation that these systems provide a rich playground of phenomena and data within which complexity science can explore its capabilities. That is to say, social sciences are a great place to look for problems in complexity. There is also surely a profound motivation for these studies from the fact that computational methods are now able routinely to simulate systems with very many interacting components. It is possible to overstate that case, however. Some of the earliest attempts to model traffic flow using physics-based models date back to the 1950s and in his groundbreaking book Micromotives and Macro Behavior of 1978, US economist Thomas Schelling investigated the dynamics of simple lattice models of social behavior by hand. If the case is going to be made that physics can contribute to an understanding of the social sciences, that is not going to be done by any crucial experiment or theory. Rather, the argument will have to be cumulated, arising on a case-by-case -case basis. So, thanks for lasting through the end. Uh, have a great day. Servus, Kameraden.